the complexity of law is such that it's probably an unwise topic to deal with at great length unless you are a lawyer, especially when talking about things like double jeopardy or stuff like that. Um, leaving that aside, I don't think many people in Britain sometimes appreciate the difference between Scottish and English law or, or that there are differences. Here's something from the um, Scottish educational system which actually illustrates some of the, the issues. Although both Scotland and England are part of the UK, Scotland has its own distinct judicial system and its own jurisdiction. Rather than being solely a common law system, Scottish law is a mixed system, and it's important to be aware of the differences. I'm going to read some of this out because I think it will illustrate that, you know, the problems of, of trying to use the laws in Scotland to address problems about immigration in England and trying to twist matters to, to, to drag that in, especially using cases that have a history that goes back nearly 40 years. And we'll be coming back to that again in a minute. The history of Scottish law. In 1707, the Treaty of Union made provision for Scotland to have its own judicial system as distinct from that in England. Historically, Scottish law adhered mainly to the influences of traditions of continental law. However, in the 19th century, English laws began to assert themselves. In many ways, Scottish law has a number of similarities to the law in South Africa, which is Roman Dutch in origin. However, the present time EU legislation that meant that many compoundary laws, especially those relating to consumer protection and commercial laws, are valid across the entire UK. However, there are still clear differences between England and, and Scottish legislation. I'm not going to read the last bit. Oh, actually, I might, actually, because it makes a good point. In Scotland, the court system consists of three separate courts. Civil cases are tried in the courts of session, criminal courts in the courts of judiciary, and also the sheriff courts. Now, Scottish laws regarding financial settlement after the divorce... Just one area of the areas in which Scottish laws and English law dramatically, dramatically is the field of financial settlements following a divorce. The Family Law of Scotland Act of 1985 adopts a fair sharing principle, which is based on dividing up all total, all total assets, usually in an even 50-50 split, while the financial requirements of both parties and any children is borne in mind. It's not top of the consideration. Spousal maintenance is restricted to just three years and is very unlikely to continue for a long time period. Meanwhile, in England, the Matrimonial Causes Act sets out that the needs of the parties and children is paramount when determining a financial settlement. And share incomes much lower down the priorities list. It's also very possible to obtain a divorce in England, but not to address the finances until many years later. Another major difference is spousal maintenance with joint life orders being fairly common, meaning that the higher maintenance earning partner must pay the other maintenance for life. So there you go. There's a huge difference straight away. Differences regarding wills and probate laws. Another area in which there are considerable differences is drawing up the area of a will in both countries. In England, marriage invalidates any previous will. However, in Scotland, this is not the case. And in Scotland, the will can be signed without any present witnesses, and witnesses can also be beneficiaries. Whereas they can't in England, you can't be a witness to a will here and beneficiary. If someone asks to be a witness, you know straight away in England you're not a beneficiary because you're banned from being one. Property law differences. One of the main differences is in property law and conveyancing, with Scottish law solicitors having a large hold over the housing market that their English counterparts. In fact, in Scotland, solicitors often sell the properties themselves. In England, surveys are paid by, by the purchaser, whereas in Scotland, the seller deals at this element. Differences between personal injury claims. Whilst the process for claiming against personal injury is largely the same, there are few notable differences. In Scotland, injury claims for the most part are successfully handled out of court. In Scotland, there are two cases at courts, the Sheriff Court for smaller claims and the Court of Session for more extensive claims. The size and severity of your personal injury claim will determine which court is used. Now, I haven't read every single word of that, but I think it should illustrate that there's some sub real substantial differences 
between the law in England and Scotland, and that while for practical purposes some of these won't come up that often, they are there and they will impact on them. And here from the Scotsman newspaper are seven differences. The drink driving limits. The limit for alcohol in your breath is 22 mi uh, micrograms per, per 100 millimetres of breath, prepared to 35 in England, buying alcohol past 10 p.m. Unlike in England, where alcohol is available almost all day or all night in the area I live in, you could just buy alcohol everywhere. Shops in Scotland are not legally allowed to sell alcohol past 10 p.m. In theory, you're not supposed to sell alcohol past 11 p.m. at night here in London. But in reality, well, you need to someone let you someone use your toilet if you're knocking your door. No such thing as arson. Arson does not exist in Scotland as a fence. The act of deliberately starting a fire is instead called rule for fire hosing. Number three would be quite funny. I wonder if someone should put that to the test and, and walk around Glasgow and Edinburgh knocking on doors and going, can I just use the, the bogs, please? Um, uh, shop opening times on Sunday. The Sunday Trading Act of 1994 made it illegal for large shops in England to be open for more than six continuous hours. However, shops in Scotland were not included in this law, allowing supermarkets and other large businesses to make the most of weekend shopping. And here, perhaps more importantly than any of those which are a bit comical, the not proven verdict, which doesn't exist in English law. This verdict is not used in England, where the only two possible outcomes are not guilty and not guilty. Now, if you're going to use Scottish and English law, to try and blather on about Stephen Lawrence at length and waffle on about him, it would probably have been a good idea to do minimal research and point and about this. To research these differences took me 20 minutes. That's not exactly a huge block of time. And another co a colleague of mine has mentioned this lady... He seems to have gone for a Burton in a certain historian's account of double jeopardy. But she won't be going for a Burton in mine and Ming. A mother who overturned an 800-year-old jaw to get justice for a murdered daughter was honoured for outstanding bravery 15 years ago this week. This is from a paper called The Northern Echo. This is quite an old article. It doesn't matter, really, because it makes the point. The fact that she got um, awarded in 2017 actually makes the point that Hamza Youssef was not standing behind her in 2017, obviously, because he wasn't even really on the political scene in any real huge way, in, or in a, in a visible way to the public at that point. And Ming was voted one of Britain's bravest women by Best Magazine for her campaign to get justice for her daughter, Julie Hogg, who was killed in 1989. Astute reader, uh, observers will notice that 1989 is before Stephen Lawrence was killed. Stephen Lawrence would not be killed for several years after this point. This is why, with P as I keep pointing out with people like this, who seem to be twisting these issues to keep going round and round them, to use them as blame games for certain ethnic groups, you need to watch the narrative. There's far more underneath. Mrs Ming found her daughter's mutilated body hidden underneath the bath at a Billingham home um, in a particularly unpleasant style, and I'm aware of the details of how she found her as well, which are, God forbid any parent should ever have to find their child like that or anyone would ever have to find a relative like that. Labour Billy Dunlop was arrested and charged with Julie's murder. Now, that's enough to illustrate the complexity of these issues and how you can't do five-minute chats just bluffing and chuntering on about the naughtiness of Stephen Lawrence and keep going back to that every six months just to sell, basically, a cat in a bag. Or basically, to use it to uh, get nods and go, it's always them, the usual suspects, which is all that's going on with those kind of talks.